coming up on Sleep, Eat, Perform, Repeat. My biggest thing is within the human performance optimization methodology is how do we calibrate first, then how do we elevate, and then how do we sustain? I think a lot of people, they get a little bit confused by, okay, performance kind of sits over here in a bucket, and then my everyday life, including my health and well-being, is over here doing whatever it's supposed to be doing. And that, you know, you're going to set yourself up for some failure because without those perceived mutually exclusive bins collectively working together, you're in trouble. We know through a lot of literature that you're never going to get to a high level if you neglect your health and well-being, no matter what you do. Welcome back to Sleep, Eat, Perform, Repeat. It's your boy, Dr. Ford Dyke, coming at you with human performance optimization. What makes us human? That's the biggest question that we can ask. Here's my episode, lock in, live and direct, forwarddyke.com. Be human. Welcome to Sleep, Eat, Perform, Repeat with your hosts, David Clancy and Kieran Dunn. This is a podcast about high performance. What we are striving to achieve is to figure out what makes high performing individuals tick, why they do what they do and why they are successful. Enjoy a journey of stories, lessons and learnings. Today we spoke with Dr. Ford Dyke, human performance consultant. Dr. Dyke collaborates globally with high level performers such as corporate executives, elite athletes, physicians, first responders and military personnel. His methodology integrates components of his professorship at Auburn, Team USA Athlete Career and Handball, which he actually unpacked for us, and experience as a performance coach for the United States Olympic and Paralympic Committee. FYI, when we started talking about handball, Ireland versus the States, not so great for the Irish. <laughs> Dr. Dyke's education, professional experience, and personal journey led to the creation of his own brand and ethos, which is a multi-dimensional space for the human experience. We asked about how much of a role growing up in Florida had on Ford's path to mindfulness practice and presence. And he took us through a live, on-air mindfulness practice. It really felt wonderful. Try it yourself. He spoke about the research and the benefits behind exposure to the green and blue spaces for downtime and exercise. Also what a typical week looks like for him, balancing rest and recovery with work and training. As Dr. Dyke says, welcome to the human experience. Poor Dyke, welcome to the show. We're really looking forward to learning from you and uh, getting to know you a little bit better. What's going on in your world? I appreciate you guys having me on, man. It's cool to be transported to Ireland this morning mm-hmm. on a Friday. So thanks again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, to everyone listening, the first thing you said was, surely you should have a drink in our hands. And we had already said we've had a few <laughs> at this point already. But uh, all, all part of optimizing performance. Absolutely. Um, for sure. Ford, we, we thought you were in Florida, which is your home, but you're not in Florida. You're somewhere else. What's going on with where you are? I'm originally from South Florida, David, but I'm now in Auburn, Alabama here at Auburn University. I'm a professor at the institution. So tell us about your day today at Auburn. What does it involve? Because how do you get the time to jump on with two drunken Irish guys? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's been wild, you know, with the pandemic shifting to mostly virtual platforms here at the institution, a lot of my day consists, unfortunately, of sitting down in this booth right here with microphones, cameras, lights, and being able to teach remotely has been great, but it's different. You know, you don't get the one-to-one connection with those students, with those customers, like I say, but it also has afforded me some time and space to do things like this, to get on other platforms, other vehicles, to share information that I know is very important for the world. And yet sometimes it gets kind of harbored in academic settings it stays within research domains or within classrooms so really it's been a silver lining for me how much of about where you grew up obviously near the water near sand near waves and it's obviously shared even in your in your bios how much did that near the upbringing as were translate across to what you're doing in auburn when we were looking it up and director mindfulness-based performance health optimization Mm -hmm. really want to even unpack the essence as to what that looks like But how much did maybe growing up in Florida help with what you're actually doing now in Auburn? 
I think it's everything. Honestly, I think, you know, without those roots and those formative years of being in those locations and those spaces and, you know, affording the opportunity to just be present and not really have the vernacular for it or any of the science behind it. It was just my way of life. I was in an amazing place. I mean, blue water and sunshine, sand between my toes and my hair down my back. And it's just, it's a way of life, you know, and that lifestyle kind of starts to shape the way in which you see the world. And so I think mindfulness has probably been a part of my life since day one, as far as I'm concerned. It's interesting if you had to vote, who do you, is more likely, someone who grew up in Manhattan or someone who grew up in, let's say, Florida or California, who do you think is more likely to be mindful? Maybe the one closer to the sea. <laughs> <laughs> There's something about that water, you know, that salinity and those ions that just kind of change the way in which you operate. I mean, we're electromagnetic creatures and we have salinity in our veins already. So I always say when I walk into the water, I kind of feel like I'm back home. How powerful a tonic is it for people from a well-being perspective to to get to the water? Because we obviously we're in an island here, so we we're all we're always pretty close. Mm-hmm. But but even even 30, 40 minutes away can seem like that's ah, a bit far. But why should we nearly make the effort if it's not on our doorstep? How can it be so good for us? You know, it's interesting because there's a lot of research now that's coming out within the green exercise domain, and that's some of the work that I've done throughout my PhD program. And green exercise is basically just movement in the presence of nature. So it could be in a park or along a stream, river, lake, walk on the beach, et cetera, being in the presence of nature, being in the mountains, being in hiking trails, things like that, as opposed to urban environments like Atlanta or LA or even London, right? Like these big cities that have a lot of noise, a lot of extra stimuli, that's changing the way in which your brain is firing and operating and it conduces stress within the system. And that low grade chronic stress can be a little bit debilitating to people and detrimental to their performance downstream. So obviously I'm a proponent of blue space being from where I'm from, but there's a lot of people I know that are from the mountains and they get the same feeling out of being in those trails. So maybe it's a mindset, but also it's an environmental aspect as well. And I always talk about mindset, but also the environmental setting. So the set and the setting, really those two things together are what makes it life, what makes it our performance. That's after sparking a question in my head. It's for you, David, and for Ford. If we're thinking about flow science, it's often done, we see it more in extreme sports because of the high challenge and the high risk that goes along with it. Is it mentioned firstly is the question? And if it's not, is it being missed about being in them environments? So you're on a BMX up in mountain, you're, you're coming, you're surfing, you're, you're doing all these crazy things in crazy environments that are pure nature. Is there something there to be looked into or has it already been? I think those extreme sports, you know, kind of to your point, they're already so extreme that the user knows there's danger involved Mm. whereas your traditional sport like let's take basketball or even soccer football of course there's danger there's always danger within sport humans are moving at high speeds and there's sometimes impact but it's different than extreme sport extreme sport is typically the one rider and the mechanism so if it's a skateboard a bmx bike snowboard surfboard skydiving whatever it may be there's a level of danger And with that, I think the human brain goes to survival mode and realizes I have to protect the system. So it changes the way in which it operates and it automatically puts that individual into a higher flow state as opposed to being playing a basketball game. You kind of have to force yourself and try all these different techniques to get yourself into flow state. Whereas with extreme sport, it kind of happens naturally. The novelty and touching on on sport and obviously the two of us were looking up your your bio for it and and you gave us some background about what happened a couple of years ago when your team came over here and played the irish team which we can leave that out but um (laughs) you you played handball for the for the u.s for you said seven years what that's correct what was that like and kind of tell us a little bit about that sport for those of you listening who maybe don't know a whole lot about handball well for starters david handball is basically soccer with your hand or water polo on land. I mean, it's kind of as simple as that. 
think about a water polo game and people are on a court, you've got almost like soccer nets on either end, seven on seven with goalies, and you're running up and down the court, passing, catching, running, throwing, cutting. It's it's everything that an American athlete does kind of rolled into one sport. So it was a pretty easy transition for me, but also leaning back on that extreme sport example that you guys brought up, you know, that's where it all started for me was extreme sports. So I come into handball and I'm kind of like, well, damn, I know how to use my body in space 360 degrees. So this could be fun. But I grew up playing basketball traditionally. So I had to learn how to throw at high velocity. You know, everything is in the front of you when you play basketball, but handball, you open up more like bow and arrow. So my whole mechanical structure had to change and that took some time. And, you know, I learned, started learning when I was 22 years old or so. And, you know, it's difficult. You start playing a sport right out the gate at 22 when that prefrontal cortex is already kind of closing down versus we're playing countries that these athletes have started when they were two, three, four, five years old. So our learning curve is a lot different. But all in all, it was an incredible experience. I was telling you guys in the pre-call, you know, the pandemic afforded me that time and space to really sit back and reflect on how incredible that experience was, but also allowed me to question, what is it that I really want to do moving forward? And do I need to continue putting these miles on my body and my mind and my heart? Just kind of got to a point where it's like, I'm ready to put the jersey on the wall and put those shoes in the closet. And it feels incredible. You know, not a lot of athletes go through successful transition, but I'm really thankful for that process. Where is the mind and body heart really going now? It's trying to stay in the present moment as much as possible. But my vision and my intentions are human performance optimization. How can I provide all of this information that I've learned over 10, 12, 15 years of education through being a student, but also a professor how can I take seven years of international athletics? How can I take all of those formative years of growing up where I grew up, package it into something that is deliverable, but not diluted? That's the challenge. You want to make it digestible, but you don't want to water it down for people. You want to have a connection. And that's when I started coming up with be human. Because to me, you meet people where you are. We're all human. We're all exactly the same. Doesn't matter where we're from, doesn't matter how tall or short we are, doesn't matter the color of our skin, eyes, hair, none of that shit matters. What matters is we're all human and we're all on the same planet. So if we can recognize that and put those borders down, maybe we can elevate ourselves and leave this place a little bit better than when we found it. Mitochondria don't care. We're all human. Yeah? <laughs> That's right, man. Exactly. Love it. So what's the big topics that you have that you're covering now, even at Auburn and what you're doing personally yourself with Fordike.com and HBO? My biggest thing is within the human performance optimization methodology is how do we calibrate first, then how do we elevate, and then how do we sustain human performance? I think a lot of people, they get a little bit confused by, okay, performance kind of sits over here in a bucket, and then my everyday life, including my health and well-being, just kind of is over here doing whatever it's supposed to be doing. And that, you know, you're going to set yourself up for some failure because without those perceived mutually exclusive bins collectively, independently, and synergistically working together, you're in trouble. We know through a lot of literature that you're never going to get to a high level if you neglect your health and well being. No matter what you do, I always tell people as a human, you're a performer. It doesn't matter what you do. I don't care if you're an athlete or a corporate executive or an airline pilot or military personnel or a podcast host or a babysitter or a janitor or a bus driver. It doesn't matter. We perform every day, 24-7, 365. It's a lifestyle. So if we can start to lean into that with practices to elevate this process, then maybe, just maybe, the next generation and the next generation We'll understand how this thing can continue to move forward from a sustainable side. Where's the starting process for this? So say you're looking at podcast hosts. That was a reference <laughs> to us. Um, <laughs> got, got that one. David one, <laughs> Kiran zero. <laughs> Talk to us about where it starts. Kind of you're talking about that methodology. We're not maybe quite elevated and sustaining that level yet. But in terms of just getting a sense as to how we're going, where what do you look at as a starting point? 
I always try to meet my clients where they are, regardless if it's a one-on-one or a team setting or a speaking engagement when I don't really have the intimacy of the audience, but I still have to you know, get a good tempo of the room so I can leave them with something that they feel. People are gonna forget what you said, but they're never gonna forget the way that you made them feel. And that's my whole premise as a professor. My students, as I go through those slides, are they really gonna remember what's on the slides? Maybe they'll study it, they'll get tested on it, and then it's in one year, out the other. But at the end of the semester, they're all saying the same thing. I enjoyed Dr. D's class because he cared about us. He allowed us to think and he allowed us to challenge dogma. He allowed us to meet us where we are. So I've taken that and I apply that to my clients. So where is my client? Where are they coming from? What are their general perceived notions on performance, on health, on well-being? Give me that baseline so I understand where their floor is. If we don't have a foundation, how the hell are we going to build a house? You're not going to start putting walls up and a roof on if you've got a shaky foundation. So Calibrate for me back in my training with psychophysiology is all about the brain. That organ, especially the frontal lobe, is what separates us from our mammalian counterparts. Without the frontal lobe, we're not really human. So that's where I start. I try to determine where is this individual within the way in which they see the world, they process information, how do they go about their day-to-day, where are their thoughts throughout the day, where are their thoughts before they go to sleep, what do they think about when they wake up, all of these things, thoughts, are really what drive behavior. So if we're not aware of our own thinking, how are we ever going to be able to change our behavior? This is brilliant because a lot of the world is focusing on performance for their employment. So they're focused on getting over the line of the next deadline. They're focusing on the next project that's coming around the corner and they neglect the health and well-being side. So what is the reason that we're doing that? Why is the world focused on that? And what can we do as maybe educators, people who are speaking about it? What can we do to help them? I think everyone's focused on the bottom line. You know, people are in companies, especially from the top down, from leadership, C-suite, etc. They're focused on their bottom line. And rightfully so. That's what allows the company to continue. But I think sometimes the top of the hill forgets about the structure of the middle and the bottom of the hill and how that feeds the top and vice versa. And instead of focusing on the individual, they try to focus on the collective team. But you guys are in sport. You know what that happens. You know what happens when we just focus on, okay, let's just look at the team and not pay attention to individuals. Mm -hmm. It's a losing season. Forget the bottom line. It's a losing season. And you can translate those same methodologies and perspectives into corporate because those corporations are basically teams that are made up of individuals with coaching staff and support staff, etc. So why don't we take what we know about athletics and apply it to corporations and see what happens? The mindfulness piece is something that we, uh, we've spoken about this a, a good bit on the show, but I suppose we're still trying to find the answers that are really resonating with a lot of people that listen to this. And for those in sporting world or in the business and the corporate world, why are we still missing it? Why are we still not getting it? That being mindful, being present, being here, being now is ultimately so important to optimize our performance. And what is it maybe that you do in your world, be that teaching or yourself personally, that does help you stay grounded and immersed so that you are giving your your best self at that point in time? It's one word answer, practice. I think we can talk about this all day long. I think we can give data We can show literature, we can show figures, we can show brain scans, we can look at EEG data. We have a plethora of information, but people are not necessarily willing to take it to the next step. And that's what I mean by practice. Not a lot of people will take what we're saying and apply it to their daily life. And that's where you see the limitation occur because information is just information. Until you actually apply it, it'll never become a part of your own personal practice and you'll never see the benefits of this practice. So I say all that to challenge you guys right now. While we're live, let's go ahead and do a short practice. Throw yourself on mute 
and I'll guide you guys as well as your listeners through a little session, about 60 seconds or so. All right. All right. Sound good? Yep. Yeah, let's do it. All right, we're muted. So just take a minute to push back from your table, get nice and comfortable. See if your feet are flat on the floor, knees are over your ankles, shoulders are down above your hips, sitting in a nice tall posture, but relaxed as well. You don't want to be sitting too tight to where you can't get relaxed and comfortable. You can allow your gaze to fall softly on the floor in front of you, or you can close your eyes, whichever is more comfortable and natural for you. And as you begin to settle in, just start to take notice of your environment that you're occupying. Maybe you're in your house right now, or you're driving along in your car. You could be in your office listening to our episode. Wherever you are, without any sort of label or judgment, try to become the observer of that environment. What does it feel like? What does it sound like? What does it look like or smell like? And as you begin to settle into your space, start to draw your awareness down into your own personal space, especially that of your body. And taking note of how your body feels physically, where your mind is cognitively, and where your heart is emotionally. And as we settle into our physical environment, as well as our own personal space, start to draw your awareness down into your respiration cycles. Without changing anything, just noticing inhalation and exhalation. And let's take one slow inhale through the nose, expanding the diaphragm, filling up the lungs, and slowly exhaling through the mouth, releasing any tension in the body, any distractions in the mind, any discomfort in the heart. And notice how easily that next inhale comes. And let's just rest here for a moment. Slowly bring your attention back to your body and releasing it back into your environment. When you're ready, you can welcome some movement back into your body, open your eyes, and come back to our space. Thank you. We were, we were actually saying before we jumped on that. So You're thanks welcome. For, thanks for I'll charge you here. guys later for that one. <laughs> <laughs> hopefully no one steered off the road drive in there yeah <laughs> right hopefully their eyes were open <laughs> with that we've had a busy day we've been quite at it today and we've been in the office all day mm -hmm. and what, what was that two minutes a minute and a half free something like that didn't yeah need, maybe didn't need anything maybe a soothing voice from florida helped hey, but uh appreciate it no but we've often we often do say that and just everyone Listen, yeah, it's not the first time we've heard it, but it's the first time we've we've been part of that experience too, Ford, and fair play to doing it. But it doesn't need a lot of time. And right. the difference it makes, it gave us for sure a bit of separation because we have had a busy day. Mm -hmm. Um that was cool. Biggest thing with that, it's a short period of time. 
but the way our brains are structured and the way they fire neuronally is all we need is about 60 seconds of quiet space. When our eyes are closed and we're focusing on our respiration, our brains and our hearts get into coherency. And once that coherency takes place, we allow that stress, that pressure, that sense of go, go, go to kind of melt away. And it brings us back to the present moment. I talked about pay attention to your vessel, right? Because our environment is one thing, but our vessel is another thing. We always have our bodies with us. We can't separate that. And we always have our minds with us, but our minds, they're kind of funny. They think a lot about the future and they reminisce a lot about the past. Rarely do they actually process information within the moment, but we can train our brains and we can educate ourselves and condition ourselves to be more in the moment, to be better performers when pressure situations are on. That's the value of the practice. It resonates and echoes. A recent guest uh, works with World Rugby. He's in Chile at the moment, Craig White. And he mentioned when we asked him what success, he said when his body is telling him because his body is always in the present. So That's when right. his body's t- and it was just, it was made more profound probably there by doing that. Understanding, oh yeah, like I was thinking about how am I getting home? What's, what's on the agenda for this evening? What do I have to do coming into this? And even though I tried to quiet that noise, it was probably still there. Probably wasn't fully here as much as I wanted to be. Probably mm-hmm. am much more now. And in that practice, you know, I wasn't even guiding you guys through come back to the breath, come back to the anchor. I was just allowing that space for you to start to notice, like you said, there's a lot of busy talk upstairs. But that's the point about calibration. I don't meet people and say, okay, let's have a 25-minute meditation session where you just sit there quietly. People can't do it. It's too far of a gap, especially in the States, when things are moving at hyperspeed. We can't sit for five minutes, let alone for 15. I don't even think we can sit for two and a half or three minutes, which is why I call it 60 seconds of space. Let's just sit for one minute. One minute, one revolution of the clock? Come on, if we can't do that, we're in trouble. The next question springs off that and it springs off your one word answer practice. That's something we should be doing where we recognize that we know it. We don't always follow through we, and we don't even complete 60 seconds on some days when we probably need it more than most. We're speaking for ourselves, but there's a lot of people probably listening who can resonate with that and understand that. Why don't we go for that practice? Why do we have a resistance or why does it just fall off? I think humans like to take the easy road. I think that's the way we're conditioned. And that's the way we've been domesticated. You know, once in a while, once in a wild time, we used to be out in nature. And then we evolved with air quotes. We started putting walls up. We started putting roofs over our head, lights, climate controlled environments. We started having more control of our settings. And I think when we start having more control of our settings, we start losing control of our set. I think our ancestors are some of the most mindful individuals on the planet because they had to be. They had to be in the moment because at any point in time, there could have been a threat showing up that they had to deal with, fight or flight. Now, how many threats are showing up? I mean, really, you're getting an email from a boss (laughs) or your teammates telling you to get the hell out of the office. Like, come on, how many real threats Someone's cutting you off on the roadway. I mean, seriously. So we've lost that control. Also, I think what that, this was that exercise that tool showed too was for the simplicity can win, right? That some of us are on our phones and go, we need to, we need to open up the app that takes us through a 12 and a half minute, you know, performance breathwork session. When in essence, like you said, that little gap, 60 seconds, when of course, you've given us some direction helped, but even just finding that little bit of solitude just to listen to our inner chatter and understand what's going on and just calibrate ourselves, that in itself is so powerful and was so short. But here's what's really interesting about that. My team here at Auburn University, the wheelchair basketball team, they had a summer journal assignment where they had two months, so 60 days of 60 seconds of space. Okay, so their assignment was for 60 days straight every day sit, stand, or lay down, whichever position you want to be in, for 60 seconds. No guidance, no real structure, just 
mm-hmm. any time of the day, any location, any position, 60 seconds. I've been debriefing with my athletes this week. Out of the 12, I've gone through about six or seven, so I'm halfway over. The majority of those six or seven, if not all of them, when I asked the question, what were some of the obstacles? What were some of the barriers? Did you miss any of the days? Oh, yeah, you know, Dr. D, I mean, I was traveling or, you know, I had family in town or it was the weekend or, you know, my discipline was a little bit low. All these excuses start to come up. And I say, look, I'm not here to judge you. You're not going to get a bad score because you didn't get all 60 days. You're just proof of concept to show yourself that it may be too much of a challenge for you to start incorporating human performance optimization if we can't build a foundation of just sitting quietly for 60 seconds. That's two shot clocks in our sport. Yeah, and it's not point not six nine percent of your day. Right. <laughs> I was like, what's he doing there? So one wow. minute. I mean, we got 1,440 minutes in our day. You're yeah. telling me you can't take one of those yeah. and do nothing? Seriously? What are the other things you do for? Because you obviously have a very good understanding level of experience behind you, having lived in different places and now obviously teaching, educating online and also people there on the ground. What other things do you do in your day to help give yourself this was the best baseline, best level of foundation, but also that ability then to be able to sustain it for the long term? Yeah, that's a great question. I was thinking about you guys last night because I knew I had the early episode. It was my 8 a.m. <laughs> and to answer your question, I take my morning routines very seriously. My alarm goes off at about 6.30, 6.45. From there, I start easing myself into the day. I start with a walk, just no phone, no headphones, just myself, a walk around the neighborhood to start to see where my mind is. Where's my body? Where am I in space? How am I feeling after my night of rest? And then from there, I come back and I do a little stretch routine. I get my smoothie in, I take my shower, and then I ease my way into, okay, what is my workday looking like? What's on the agenda? What's on the docket? All the while, just maintaining that present moment awareness, just staying within flow, not worry too much about what's happening at 4 p.m., focusing on what's happening now. Throughout the day, making sure that I'm getting some movement in, walking outside, take a networking call, step out back, watch some of the golfers, which is pretty nice living on the golf course. Go out front, pet the dog, get some water, take some short stretch breaks. Then I get my movement sessions in. So Monday, Wednesday, Friday, I go get my resistance training in along with sauna. That's super important to me. Walk back mid-afternoon. Then I get my meditation in for about 10, 15, 20 minutes. Tuesday, Thursdays, I've got my same routine, but now I incorporate Pilates, which has been really helpful for me as an athlete in transition. The weekends I take very seriously as well. That's my time. I love rest and recovery. So by Monday morning, I'm dialed back and ready to go. There's an ebb and flow in life. And if we get on that wave, which I served my whole life, then we're never really going to fall. We'll have slips, but are we ever going to fall if we're flowing with the rhythm and flow of life? That's brilliant. And then going into your background in sports, so we're talking routines. Before, let's say, Team USA handball game, did you have a set routine that you'd go through? Would you do a meditation or mindfulness practice before you went out on the court? Definitely not. I would always keep that earlier in the day. I wouldn't really ever bring that into the arena. Mm -hmm. I felt like if I was bringing that into the arena, I had a problem. I wasn't already dialed in. In fact, if I'm on the bus or the plane or the train, if I'm not focused by then, then I have a problem. So I left all of my meditation, all of my mindset, and all my awareness early in the morning, way prior to match play. So by match play, I know my mind is set and I know I have a good sense of what the environment's gonna be like because we had a shoot around or walk through. That way when I come into the actual moment of getting ready for the match, it's music, it's movement to get my mind and body connected, it's hydration, it's making sure my fuel tank is full of nutrition and less rock. If I'm not ready to go by then, I'm never going to be ready to go. Love it. Moving forward, but still being here, <laughs> still being present. 
Um, I love that. That was good. <laughs> that was Plus bad, one so. for that one. Yeah. <laughs> You're awake for that. Um, look, the, the that space for the human experience to to capture and draw on those words that I've seen on your on your LinkedIn. And obviously we're touched a little bit on the mindfulness practice that which you're obviously doing along in auburn what else what else are you doing what else is really exciting you as well in terms of helping let's improve our capacity as humans getting us to understand ourselves a little bit more and how we can help ourselves lately it's been speaking engagements getting into environments where there's more than a team there's more than a classroom of individual there's more than researchers at a conference there's audiences that I've never met before. And that's a huge challenge to come in at six foot four as a white boy from Jupiter, Florida with dreadlocks and a beard. And my name is Ford Dyke. And I come in, how are we doing? Let's take a seat. In fact, let's take a deep breath. And as soon as I say, let's take a deep breath, now I've got your attention. Because that's a visceral feeling that we all do automatically. But we also have the ability to turn it to conscious control. And if I meet people where they are with their respiration, it's game over. I have their attention the whole time because they're in alignment. I've brought them into coherence without them even really even knowing it. So no matter what I'm saying, I'm getting them to feel something. And I think that's what a lot of speakers are missing out on. Yeah, you have great information or you have a really cool pitch deck but I didn't feel anything. So I'm not going to remember what you said. Thanks very much for so much that we went through there. I think we'll have to definitely continue this conversation, but we've come probably to the last question of the show. Unless David, you've been sparked by any further ones. No, I just deep breath and coherence as well. That's again, just echoing through, you know, we're, we do sessions all the time, keynotes, workshops all the time. And oftentimes we're talking about how to, get everyone on board, get everyone centered and in the room and engage and be here now to take what we're trying to give them that little bit of value in. So yeah, what happens? We walk in, we say who we are, we we start talking, we start interacting a bit, try to get them on board. But that piece you said again, of just getting that sort of gut sensation as to, okay, let's, let's get together here. Now we're going to have a little dialogue together. Just love that. Yeah. Yeah. We're all in the room. Yeah. And that you guys can steal it as long as you give me a kickback on every one of your workshops. <laughs> yeah. We'll give Damn. you a mention on LinkedIn, though. We'll give you a mention on LinkedIn for sure. For us. Appreciate for sure. it. Brilliant. So you may have heard it, but the signature question of the show, which we've asked over 180 people now, um, what does high performance mean to you, Dr. D? Oh, man, high performance. It's uh, It's interesting because of the caveat high. Like to me, why does it have to be high? Why can't it be just performance? And why can't we take high out or low or moderate or mediocre or optimal or whatever and put human in front of it? Let's focus on human performance. Let's open our apertures a little bit, see what's going on on the horizon. So when we focus back on what's going on in front of us, we understand thyself. Because if we understand ourselves, we'll understand others. And if we understand others, we'll understand the whole picture. Like I said earlier, we're all in this together. So if we're not putting the work in that we need as individuals, as a group, as a species, we're never going to level up. And if the last two and a half years have taught us anything, we're all connected. Well, Dyke, thank you very much for giving us time in your morning, um, end of the week. And for really, really making us feel a part of that today. That was pretty special for us. Really felt immersed in that. Um, so thanks again for that. And wishing you the very best with, with all you're doing. Um, some amazing work. And yeah, have a great weekend. It was great to talk to you today. My pleasure. Thank you, guys. Enjoy the rest of your weekend as well. <laughs>